Welcome. It's my extreme pleasure to serve as a moderator for today's Ask an MS Expert webinar. I'm John Strom, and I'm the host of the Real Talk MS podcast. Each week, Real Talk MS reaches thousands of people in more than 90 countries around the world with the news that people affected by MS need to know. I'm also a non-scientist member of the International Progressive MS Alliance Scientific Steering Committee, where I work to ensure that the perspectives and priorities of families affected by progressive MS are represented in all of the projects and work undertaken by the Alliance. I'm a district activist leader for the National MS Society, and I also chair the Society's California Government Relations Advisory Committee. My wife, Jean, lived with progressive MS for 23 years, so I've had a front row seat experiencing all the ways that MS can impact a family. I'm thrilled to be with you today, and I see that people are continuing to join our webinar, so let's give them just another few seconds, and then we'll get started. This webinar is really all about getting answers to the questions that are on your mind. So before getting underway, I want to review how you can submit your questions. If you're connecting through GoToMeeting and you had two options when you joined our webinar, they were either phone or you could have joined using your personal computer. Now, if you joined us using your personal computer's microphone and speakers, you'll have the ability to submit comments and questions through the chat box that you should see on the right-hand side of your screen. If you happen to join by phone, then you're going to be in listen-only mode. Today's webinar is also being streamed live on Facebook and YouTube, so welcome to everyone that's joining us on those platforms. If you have the ability, I encourage you to submit your questions and comments as we have a team capturing those as well. As I chat with our experts today, you can submit your questions as they come to mind, and we're going to address as many of your questions as we can. Now, I know many of you might have some very specific questions related to your own situation. Because of our limited time together, we're going to be focusing on the questions that pertain to everyone. And following the webinar, the Society's MS Navigator team will be standing by to address those specific questions that you might have. I'll let you know how you can reach an MS Navigator before the end of today's program. Obviously, I can't make this happen all by myself. There's a lot of amazing people working behind the scenes, and one of them is Julie Field. And Julie is going to help me today by pulling together your questions in the background while I'm busy talking. We may even get Julie to pop up on screen and ask some of those questions herself. I should also mention that due to the large number of participants we have today, everyone's been placed in listen-only mode. And if you're interested in reviewing today's discussion with our experts, this webinar is being recorded and it'll be available on the Society's website for reference. Today's Ask an MS Expert webinar is one of a series of virtual opportunities the Society is committed to offering. So I hope you plan on joining us each week. And hearing your questions and listening to what's on your mind helps shape future Ask an MS Expert programs so I hope you're ready to participate. Our objective today and our objective in all of the Ask an MS Expert programs is to connect with you, share important information that you can rely on, and provide a forum for you to connect with experts on the topics that are on your mind, the topics that really impact people affected by MS. When we read through your feedback on our previous Ask an MS Expert programs and we look at the questions that we're continuing to receive, it's clear that COVID-19 will continue to be a hot topic in all of our lives for the foreseeable future. So we're going to continue providing the latest updates on the key questions that keep coming up, as well as the new information that we learn each and every week. Now, you may have already heard that the National MS Society is the largest private funder of MS research in the world. And today, we're also going to get a special update on the Society's MS research funded projects. And of course, we're going to spend time answering the questions that are on your mind. We'll also share some key resources that you can turn to anytime for credible, reliable information 
about COVID-19 and MS. Now, before we dive in, I'd like to acknowledge that these are new and rapidly evolving times, so we do have a disclaimer to review. COVID-19 is a new coronavirus, and limited published data is available about this virus and MS. The information and recommendations presented in this program are based upon the individual professional opinion of MS experts and the evidence currently available about MS, infections, and disease-modifying therapies. This is a rapidly evolving situation and will update information as it becomes available. The information that is shared does not substitute for your healthcare provider recommendations. Please check with your healthcare provider before making any changes to your treatment plan. And be sure to check the society's website at nationalmssociety.org slash COVID-19 to keep up with the most updated information on MS and COVID-19. Well, now let's meet our experts. Kathy Costello is the Associate Vice President of Healthcare Access for the National MS Society. Kathy leads the Society's strategic initiative on access to quality healthcare, which focuses on self-advocacy, professional workforce development, healthcare professional relationships, and wellness. Kathy was a nurse practitioner and adjunct assistant professor at the Johns Hopkins MS Center, excuse me, MS Center in Baltimore, Maryland, and she's written and lectured extensively on MS and MS care. Dr. Bruce Bebo is the executive vice president of research at the National MS Society. Dr. Bebo leads the society's global research strategy focused on achieving breakthroughs for people affected by MS. And if I may add, leading the global strategy that's focused on achieving breakthroughs in MS research is my definition of the most awesome job in the world. Bruce is also a member of the MS Society's senior leadership team. He serves on the scientific steering committee of the International Progressive MS Alliance and the programmatic panel for the MS program at the congressionally directed medical research program. Dr. Bebo brings 30 years of experience in MS research in academic industry and nonprofit organizations to the table. And Bruce was inspired to join the MS movement by his mother who lived with progressive MS. We're now going on week nine and we're committed to keeping everyone updated on the latest news about COVID-19 and MS. Last week, we talked about what the experts are learning from the data that's being collected on people living with MS who have gotten COVID-19. We also covered the latest information about the development of a COVID-19 vaccine, and we talked about some of the things that people living with MS should keep in mind as we begin to venture out of the house. Today, we're going to start with an update on COVID-19 and MS from Kathy Costello. And Kathy, Let's talk about some of the new things that we've learned over the past week. What can you tell us about coronavirus vaccine research and when a vaccine might be available? Yeah, thanks very much. Thanks, it's great to be here. And this is a really important question that's on the minds of just about everybody uh, because many people feel and they've heard that in order for us to really reopen the world back up again and get back to normal that having a vaccine would be an optimal way for everyone to be able to do that safely. But vaccine research is really quite complex and it takes quite a few steps. Uh, for example, the chicken pox vaccine for kids took 20 years to develop. Now we're looking at a much shorter timeline in, in regards to this coronavirus and that's for many different reasons. First of all, there, are, there is so much emphasis and so many people that are interested in literally this race to get a vaccine or multiple vaccines out there. And many people, including Dr. Anthony Fauci, have said it's probably going to take more than one vaccine in order to really uh, treat uh, adequately. So where we are right now is there's over 100 vaccine candidates that are out there in some stage of research development. And there's probably three though that are leading the list um, and leading the charge to getting us to the point of actually having a commercially available vaccine. And of those three, and that's a group at Oxford in the UK, 
and then in the US, two companies, Pfizer and Moderna. Uh, the UK group is for probably the farthest along. And a lot of that has to do with previous research that they had done on coronavirus. And so since this coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2, bears a lot of genetic similarity to SARS that we saw in the early 2000s, they're able to use some of that research in order to stimulate the research here. And they are already in human clinical trials. Um, and this summer, we'll likely start to have some results from those trials. They just recently reported on a study in rhesus monkeys where the vaccine was actually effective. Now, obviously, rhesus monkeys are not human, but they are the closest in terms of genetics. And so oftentimes when a vaccine works there, it can also work in people. So what are the hurdles? Why the 20 years for chickenpox? Because we really have to have attention to safety as well as efficacy. And both of those things are equally important. You can't have one without the other. So while this is going at a much more rapid pace, you still have to pay attention to those very important aspects. And Pfizer and Moderna are also entering into clinical trials a little earlier on, but the timeline for this, the Oxford group may actually have something by uh, early 2021. That doesn't mean it will be commercially available to everyone. And most experts have estimated that having a commercially available vaccine available to the mass population, the earliest is probably the end of 2021. The first people who would get a vaccine would be the frontline workers, clearly. And then others would be included as supplies allow. While we're talking about vaccines, Kathy, I'd like to drill down just a little bit because I know a lot of people who are receiving Ocrevus infusions have some concerns about how their disease-modifying therapy might impact a COVID-19 vaccine. What can you tell them about that? Yeah, that's a great question. And there are quite a few people who are on Ocrevus. And there are some uh, recommendations that are made uh, actually in the prescribing information for Ocrevus. Uh, not just for this type of vaccine, this is for any vaccine. And vaccines come in two major types, live attenuated, which is a weakened form of the actual virus, uh, a non-virulent strain, clearly, and then those that are not live. And they can be basically, they're a piece of the viral protein or a sugar that is given uh, with, a, with a, a kind of a vehicle that gets it into the human body and then the immune system can make a response to it. So those are the two major classes of vaccines. There's other nuanced differences as well, but for, for our conversation, that's what's important. And each of these types of vaccines is gonna provoke a different type of immune response. And that's important when you're giving a drug like Ocrevus, which depletes certain types of cells. And in this case, the B, like boy, lymphocyte. And they're actually important to immunity. And so the recommendation is that all vaccines uh, should be given to, that are needed, should be given to people at least four weeks prior to starting Ocrevus if it's a live attenuated vaccine or a minimum of two weeks prior to Ocrevus infusions if it's a non-live vaccine. So then the question becomes, well, geez, what are you going to do when I've already had my Ocrevus and now we have a COVID vaccine, can I just go get it? I've already had my Ocrevus. Well, you're gonna to have to probably wait a little while for the cell populations to regenerate. And they do, which is why we give this every six months, uh, Ocrevus every six months. So that will become a conversation and lab tests to identify when you would be able to have the best response to a vaccine for COVID. And I'm sure that it will be recommended and it will just be a timing issue as to when it's best for someone to have that vaccine. Well, thank you for that clarification. You know, a few weeks ago, we, we talked about the fact that a, a new patient registry had been established to track people living with MS who had been diagnosed with COVID-19 so we could learn more. Uh, in North America, it, it's the COVID ms data collection effort. I'm wondering if you can share any new or additional information that we might be learning from this patient registry. 
Yeah, thanks. This is a really a very important effort because the idea is that eventually we'll be able to answer the very important questions that both providers and people with MS have. So these are the questions like, should I be on my disease modifying therapy? Should I change my therapy? Am I at greater risk because I have MS? These are the questions that people have. And it's hard to answer that when this is a virus that prior to December of 2019, we didn't know anything. We didn't even know it existed. And so all of this is new. There are no data at this point in time. So how we get that is to report on cases of people with MS who have also developed COVID. And so I must say, Bruce, my co-presenter today, was instrumental in the development of this database. And we partnered with the Consortium of MS Centers and the MS Society of Canada to have this database available. And this is one where healthcare professionals enter information on people that they see with MS and related diseases who also have developed COVID-19. And we're looking to see those people who have recovered well and those that have had a, a really difficult course with their infection. So to date, and that's of this morning, actually, there's just a little over 200 uh, cases that have been entered into this database, 204 to be exact. And while that's a very small number relative to the number of people in the United States who have MS, which is now close to a million, and we certainly don't expect all 1 million to have COVID-19, but we do need an increased number of cases in order to draw any conclusions from the data that's in the database. So at present, the best we can say is there doesn't seem to be any huge signal uh, that people with MS are at greater risk of getting COVID-19 and getting infected with this coronavirus. And there doesn't seem to be any signal at this point of to, that would implicate any of the disease modifying therapies um, as more problematic, one more problematic than the other. Uh, there's actually no signal that we see. Now that could change, right? That's great information, but it could certainly change as more people are entered into the database. One thing that I can say is that many, many more people with MS who have had COVID that have recovered or are recovering. And that's great news. And it's the vast majority of people um, who have MS and COVID in this database are recovering. And what we see in terms of risk factors that may make the disease course more difficult are the very same risk factors that we see in the general population. So over age 65, uh, having uh, comorbid conditions like high blood pressure, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, lung conditions, uh, recent cancer history. Uh, those very same risk factors apply in this database just as we see in the general population. I will say that we will continue to provide updates on this because this is very, very important information. And when we're able to really make more of it in terms of helping people make clinical decisions around their MS and their disease modifying therapies, we will definitely be sharing that information with everybody. Well, that's great. And that was some really important information that I'm sure a lot of people were, were, were very gratified to hear that being diagnosed with MS, at least from what we're learning so far, does not necessarily put you more at risk for contracting the virus. Uh, the things that put people at risk are the same things that put everyone at risk, the same comorbid conditions that you spoke about. That's correct. That's great. Well, there are a couple more topics I'd like to get into if we can. What can you tell us about the recent reports of a rare potential COVID-19 complication in children? Yeah, so uh, thanks for that question. And this, this is uh, difficult because, you know, we, we certainly don't want anyone to get COVID-19. And we're always even more upset when it's the, the kiddos that are, that are contracting this virus. And now we're hearing that there may be a complication uh, in kids that is related to this virus. So this is a inflammatory condition and it's a multi-organ. So multiple organs in the body are affected inflammatory syndrome. And it looks like it may be rare, but related to being infected with this coronavirus. This virus is very, is highly virulent and it can be deadly. And we've already seen that. There's a huge number of people, a quarter of a million people in the world 
who have died from this virus. And in kids and in young adults, there seems to be a much bigger uh, inflammatory response. And sometimes that inflammatory response gets out of control. And when it gets out of control, it can cause a lot of problems. We see that in the lungs in adults, getting a respiratory condition that's highly inflammatory and makes it difficult to breathe. And in these kids, multiple systems seem to have effects of inflammation that can be very damaging. It's not always easily seen. These kids often have high fever, but they don't have respiratory symptoms. They may have abdominal discomfort. And the, the good news, if there could be a silver lining here, is that providers are now looking for this in kids. They're looking to see, is this going on? And trying to learn as much as they can as fast as possible so that they can intervene and uh, help kids have this inflammation settle down so that they don't have bad outcomes from the virus. Earlier this week, there were reports about doctors having some success using MS drugs in combination with antiviral drugs as treatments for COVID-19. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, this was really exciting information to me. Um, I have to say that I actually predate in my MS practice the disease-modifying therapies and, and actually concentrated my efforts in my career once beta seron, which is interferon beta 1b, was approved in 1993. Now, mind you, I was 12 when I graduated from nursing school, so I'm obviously quite young still. But in any case, uh, interferon beta 1b or beta seron is one of those drugs. And there was a, a publication this week in an, a very prestigious journal, Lancet, um, describing uh, the effect of interferon beta 1b in combination with two antiviral drugs. And that three-way combination was able to help people recover quicker from the virus versus those who didn't have that combination. And many think the anti-inflammatory properties of the interferon as well as its antiviral properties may contribute to some of that success. So that's very exciting news. It's relatively small number, but still in all, important to see some impact from uh, one of our MS drugs. And the other is methotrexate. Methotrexate is actually an immunosuppressant drug. And a number of years ago, it was used in MS um, following a few small clinical trials that indicated in progressive MS, it might have some benefit. Now there's been other treatments, of course, that have come along since, that might actually be better and safer in MS. And methotrexate, though, is still used in conditions such as rheumatoid arthritis. And it's also been found, and this was in a news release this week, that in combination with an antiviral drug, it may also have that impact of uh, accelerating recovery from this uh, COVID-19 uh, disease. And there were those, in fact, an MS provider in Texas and someone who has presented for us a number of times have both said in this news release that this really could be very helpful for people with COVID-19 to have this combination. And I will say that another drug has also been under study for its anti-inflammatory properties, and that's Gelenia. Now, I don't have any results on that, but the idea behind it is if there's this enormous inflammatory response in some people, perhaps giving one of these anti-inflammatory drugs for MS and some that are used in other conditions like rheumatoid arthritis might help settle that inflammation down and help someone recover quicker. So really pretty exciting news. You know, Kathy, it seems like every week we get questions from people who are concerned about their disease-modifying therapies and COVID-19. We've heard from Deborah, who said she needs more information on DMTs and how they affect her risk of COVID-19. Are there any updates to the guidance that the society has provided about the use of disease-modifying therapies during the COVID-19 pandemic? Well, I completely agree with Deborah that more information is exactly what we need. And the difficulty is, as I mentioned earlier, this is a novel virus. So our experience and our data with the virus and our disease-modifying therapies is really lacking. And I mentioned the database collection as one way that we get to that. 
And there's also other researchers taking a look at uh, what the interaction could be with the disease-modifying therapies and this uh, coronavirus. Having said all that, the uh, National Medical Advisory Committee, which is a committee of healthcare professionals that advise uh, the society on medical issues, has been looking at our disease-modifying therapy guidance during COVID, the COVID pandemic, that we issued back at the end of March, which really isn't that long ago, but in COVID time, it seems like a lifetime ago. And so the committee has been reviewing that to see if we need to change that guidance and update that guidance. And I do believe that updated guidance will be available uh, very, very soon, perhaps as soon as next week. The point is that it's very difficult, nearly impossible to provide blanket guidance because MS is so heterogeneous and different for everyone and response to treatment is different and comorbid conditions are different, ages are different. And all of these factors are important in the decision-making that a provider and a person living with MS have. This is a shared decision-making model where the provider and the person have to discuss all the risks and benefits that are particular to that individual and then make a decision. So we will have guidance and we will have factors that people can consider when they're having that conversation. But the guidance won't be do this, don't do that. It will be these are the things to talk about and these are the things that will play into the decision that you and your provider make together. Well, Kathy, thank you for keeping us updated on the evolving issues surrounding COVID-19 and MS. Now. I'd like to shift to another topic that's near and dear to my heart. I believe that MS research is what creates the future for people affected by MS. And when it comes to talking about MS research, I can't imagine anyone that I'd rather be talking to than Dr. Bruce Gibo. Bruce, our audience keeps reminding us that MS research is important to them as well. For example, we heard from Kevin who said he always loves to hear about what's happening in MS research because it brings hope. Carla wants to know what significant progress is being made by the society to find a cure. And Marsh wants to know how MS research is being impacted by COVID-19. So Bruce, I guess I'd like to start by asking you which research programs, what progress that you're seeing are you particularly excited about? Sure, I'm happy to be here with you and happy to share um, what I'm excited about and just want to say how lucky we are to have uh, Kathy Costello as part of our team. Um, I mean, that information she shared is just really terrific and, and well um, presented and clear. So um, uh, thank you, Kathy, for that. And John, you know, together, all of us together, we've achieved more breakthroughs in MS than the world has seen for any other neurologic disease up to this point. And I think we're really at this precipice. I feel like the next chapter in our story about MS really could be our last chapter. Uh, we've never been closer to a cure. We've never been closer or had a better understanding of how to prevent MS and, and even reverse its course. And, um, and we've never been closer to finding treatments for progressive forms of MS as those treatments as effective as the ones we have for relapsing forms. And, and really to bring life-changing solutions and treatments to everyone with MS. We've made really terrific strides in our understanding of the immune pathways that lead to MS attacks. And that knowledge is really is what led to, is, has led to all the disease-modifying treatments that we have right now for, for MS. We also know that the earlier a person gets diagnosed with MS, the better the outcomes are gonna be. And so I'm really particularly excited, I think, about the investments that we're making and made investments made possible by uh, everyone um, joining us today. Um, the investments we're making in biomarkers and advances in MRI imaging, and, and they're really starting to get us closer to diagnosing MS at the very, very earliest stages. Um, some of the biggest advancements in MS research, I'd say over the last five to eight years have been in myelin repair. Uh, we now appreciate that the nervous system has an untapped potential to promote myelin repair and MS. And we're discovering ways to unleash this potential. So these 
strategies are making their way to the clinic. And I'm optimistic that one or more of these approaches will be found to be beneficial for people living with MS. Um, there's also a growing appreciation that MS may be a preventable disease. And you heard me right, John, <laughs> I did say preventable. Uh, and that's a concept that, um, the concept really is that we might be able to identify people that are at high risk for developing MS, and then intervenes, intervene in ways that might prevent the clinical appearance of the disease uh, before it really gets going, before it get, gains traction. Um, we are starting to chart out the investments that we'll need to make to accelerate progress to prevent MS, and that's part of our Pathways to Cure research roadmap. And then finally, John, we all know there's really a paucity of effective treatments for progressive forms of MS. Now, the progressive form of MS is really driven less by inflammation and more by a gradual process of nervous tissue destruction, and we think it might have parallels with other neurodegenerative diseases like for example, like Alzheimer's disease. But some of the mysteries of this form of MS are starting to be revealed. And recent progress has been catalyzed to a large degree by a large international effort, John, you mentioned earlier, Nicole, the International Progressive MS Alliance. And this is a resources of more than 20 different MS societies around the world that are being pooled and invested in large global collaborative research efforts that with a strong focus on discovering new treatments for this particularly hard to um, treat form of MS. You know, I mentioned earlier that the National MS Society is the largest private funder of MS research in the world. So can you tell us what that actually means and, and how much research are we talking about? Sure, so the society currently is supporting over 200 different research projects. And we collectively, and again, through the support of so many um, generous people, many of whom are on this call, we've made research commitments over multiple years of around $80 million. It's a big number. And, and because people with MS don't really care where the next breakthrough for or cure for MS is gonna come from, we fund research that's agnostic to geography. We don't care where, where the next cure or treatment for MS comes from. But the, the principle really is to fund the best research and to fund research that has the highest likelihood to lead to breakthroughs to cure uh, uh, for MS. And we fund basic research that reveals some of the fundamental underpinnings of MS. We also fund studies that translate the basic research and get it closer to testing in humans and also we do fund some clinical trials and, and especially clinical trials that are testing approaches and these can be pharmaceutical or non-pharmaceutical, uh, but testing approaches that, that really don't have a commercial incentive to drive them, that, that aren't gonna be funded by a biotech or pharma, but they do have potential to be game changers for people living with MS. So that's our sweet spot for our investments in clinical research. And we're also, in addition to funding research, um, John, a fo a focused on encouraging the best and brightest minds to pursue careers in MS research. And we do this by funding fellowships. And so since awarding our first fellowship in 1947, the society has trained a th more than a thousand scientists. And, and these are all the scientists that have made the significant contributions to our understanding of MS, and, and, and really every disease modifying treatment that we have today, the, the key scientists that led the development of those treatments, practically all of them were supported and encouraged to pursue careers in MS through a fellowship from the society. And then finally, you know, I wanna share um, that we, we also use our, our influence, our expertise to build trusted partnerships with other funders, with the, the federal government, with industry, with other health focused charities to meet, to align our funding, make sure we're driving to uh, common goals and driving to the, the most you know, highest priority research. Well, while we're talking about the society's research portfolio, I'm wondering if you can share how the MS Society decides on which research it's going to fund. Yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, we really, the society works with, engages with the world's scientific experts. Um, in addition to, and you mentioned this, John, that you were a non-scientist member of the Scientific Steering Committee of the Progressive Alliance, you know, we also are engaging people affected by MS as well as scientific experts 
to really to steer our research priorities. And we use a very highly regarded scientific due diligence process to identify the most promising research uh, 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 worldwide. And I'd, I'd say we take a portfolio approach to making our research investments. So we're, we're made, our investments are strategic. We're looking always for ways to leverage these investments by partnering with other funders so that we get to the greatest impact possible. We sort of, we're balancing the risk and reward. We make long-term investments and short-term investments. And we also try to strike a balance between research that reveals insights into stopping MS and uh, restoring loss function and of course, ending or preventing MS. And then, and then finally, you know, because we, we can't always predict where the next breakthrough um, for MS is gonna come from, we wanna be able to stay nimble. Um, we wanna be able to respond to, to unanticipated or unforeseen opportunities that could accelerate research breakthroughs as well. You know, if we can transition for a moment from the strategic to things that are happening around us right now, What's been the impact of COVID-19 on the society's research efforts? Yeah, well, you know, this pandemic is affecting everybody. Um, and, uh, and it has stopped or significantly slowed down a lot of parts of our economy uh, and our society and research is not an exception. Um, so many universities and other kinds of research institutions are closed to everyone except essential staff. Now, what this means for our research is that um, for the most part, there's some exceptions, but for the most part, the generation of new data really is greatly diminished, at least for the time being. Now, uh, we recently uh, sent out a survey to our funded investigators. We wanted to learn a little bit more kind of exactly what, um, what they were experiencing, what these delays look like. So, so when we asked if, um, if our funded investigators research was impacted by uh, COVID and the shut shutdowns, associated with COVID, 92% of our investigators said yes, that it did impact their, their research. So that's the kind of bad news. But the, the good news is that uh, when we ask them, you know, did, are you experiencing any irretrievable loss of data or, uh, or loss of other assets that you need to complete the studies? More than 80% indicated that there was no irretrievable loss in data or, or resources. So, um, so that's good news. Um, Based on where we're at right now, um, our, our researchers estimate that it'll probably take on average about three months to get back on track once, they, once the restrictions in their um, local areas are lifted. And that, and that would, of course, be in addition to any time um, that they're out of the lab or clinic, um, which is going to be variable depending on you know, what, where you live. So I think we can expect a delay to many of the projects by maybe six months um, to a year sort of depending on how all this lasts. And, I, and some projects might also need additional resources to complete their goals. So I would just share you know, that that means that uh, you know, your support, the support of everyone listening today is even more critical than ever to help us keep this momentum up in our progress to um, finding breakthroughs for MS. Now, the progress is still being made. Our investigators are taking this time away from the lab they're analyzing the data they've already collected, um, the data they collected before the shutdown. They're writing and they're submitting their scientific papers, communicating the findings from their data to others and working, kind of thinking about their next hypothesis that they wanna test when they get back to the lab. Um, and it's interesting, like, like a lot of us, um, they're also learning how to be productive um, remotely. So how many of us were on Zoom meetings before you know, all of this happened? I was, but I mean, um, you know, a lot of us weren't, and and our our scientists are getting comfortable with this technology. They're, um, I think, even in some cases, they're developing collaborations with other investigators that are located, you know, halfway around the world that using this new technology. So there's a little silver lining there, I think. And you know, John, I, I wouldn't be surprised um, when we when we're through this, and hopefully that'll be sooner rather than later. But when we when we look back. Um, you know, uh, when this is all over that I think we're going to see this as a moment in time when, you know, we've we got a new perspective on MS and where new ideas sort of had their genesis, their, their beginnings. And um, so I'm, 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 I'm excited about that possibility. And, and I also wanted to share with everyone that, you know, discoveries are still being made. We're still seeing progress, even during the time of COVID. You might, 
people might be aware of a new disease modifying treatment that was approved for relapsing forms of MS. Maybe you remember it as ozonamod, uh, but it's now the, the brand name is Zaposia. So that's something that's just happened in the last month or two. Um, I think people will be interested to learn that the uh, Katerina Akasaglu, who won the uh, Brantic Prize just, I think, last year, recently uh, shared um, that she's developed a better understanding of the cells and the pathways that lead to oxidative damage in the nervous system. And then she's leveraged this understanding to identify new drug targets that could protect the brain from damage um, that's caused during MS. And then just another interesting thing that's popped up in the last few weeks was a study from Germany that showed levels of a molecule that's produced by gut bacteria, and this is called propionic acid, and uh, they showed that this was reduced in people with MS, and, and then found that supplementation with propionic acid led to less relapses and disability progression. Um, and I just uh, remind everyone that uh, more research updates uh, can be found on our website. And then you mentioned, you know, this, I talked earlier about this peer review process, John. In fact, as a, as a matter of fact, today, what I was doing before I got on this call, and then I'll be jumping back to it once I'm done, is, um, you know, we've really pivoted. Um, we're still evaluating um, grant applications. Our peer review committee meetings are meeting virtually, um, and we have a peer review committee meeting actually going on right now. Um, our research program's advisory committee is, um, is going to be virtu uh, meet virtually, um, and, and this is the group that helps um, advise the society on, on the most promising research projects. So we're continuing to evaluate new opportunities, and we'll continue to uh, fund new opportunities, and we'll continue to develop and, and align our research to this Pathways to Cure research roadmap. Um, and so I would just leave that by saying, you know, we need everyone's support now more than we've ever needed it before to just keep up this momentum um, so that, you know, we can write this last chapter in the MS story. Well, thank you, Bruce, for bringing us up to date on some of the latest information about society-funded MS research. Now, I'd, I'd like to focus our time on addressing more questions that we're receiving from our audience. Uh, and Bruce, I, I'll, I'll start with you since you're already up on camera. Um, a, a cure for MS is on the minds of many people, if not everyone. Uh, we received a question on Instagram asking, will we ever get a cure for MS? And Bailey on Facebook wants to know roughly how close are we to finding a cure? Now, we know it's not one cure for MS, but many that we need. So Bruce, how close are we seeing any of these? Well, um... The short, the short answer to the question of, of will we have a cure for MS is yes. I mean, I don't think there's any doubt that we will have a cure. I mean, I think that the, the bigger question is when, and of course, that's a little hard to predict. Uh, but what I, and I mentioned this in, in, in brief um, during my comments, but I'll dig into it a little bit more now, John, and, and, I, and I know you and I have talked about this before, but I'm really encouraged about the progress we're making and potentially being able to prevent MS. And I'll highlight a recent study that makes me um, you know, uh, enthusiastic about that. So um, we, uh, one of the biomarkers that's being developed for MS is a, is a molecule called neurofilament light chain. These are structural proteins that um, kind of create structure in the nerve cells in your nervous, essential nervous system. And when your nervous system gets damaged and it's sort, sort of agnostic to the kind of damage, it could be uh, head trauma or could be MS, but when it gets damaged, these proteins get released and we can measure them in the blood. And it's becoming a, a um, not quite ready for prime time, but it's, it's looking like this could be an interesting biomarker to measure um, progression in, in MS. And uh, part of the reason why I think we can um, get, get closer to preventing MS is illustrated by a study that um, was reported recently looking at the blood levels of neurofilament in uh, people before they developed MS and, uh, and, and looked at the levels of this neurofilament in a cohort of people before they developed MS and a cohort of people that didn't go on to develop MS. And we've all thought for many years that there's activity, there's damage that's occurring in the nervous system before anybody shows any clinical signs of it. Uh, and what this study revealed was there were neurofilament um, levels in the blood of people that went on five or six years later to develop MS were higher than in people that didn't go on to develop MS. So it confirms really 
that there's something going on before you ever develop the clinical signs of MS. So if we can um, develop a pipeline, a strategy of screening uh, people who are at high risk for MS, um, using this neurofilament test, using a clinical history, perhaps uh, uh, with imaging, I think we could start um, identifying people uh, at very high risk for MS uh, before they start showing any clinical signs and could potentially even start treating people before, uh, before MS starts. And this is actually, um, this principle is being um, borne out in other chronic autoimmune diseases like type 1 diabetes and rheumatoid arthritis, where early, um, where there are biomarkers for those diseases that, um, that indicate risk for disease and intervention intervening before clinical signs of those diseases has been shown to greatly delay and in some cases stop um, the disease in its tracks. So there's one of the cures, John, you mentioned cures. One of them would be preventing MS from the, uh, uh, the first place. And, uh, and I would say we're getting pretty close to that. And, and I know we're crunched on time. The other, the one thing I'd also wanna share with our, our viewers and listeners is, you know, I think the tremendous um, develop, you know, advance in disease modifying therapy is getting us closer to a cure for particularly for relapsing forms of MS. And a quick, easy way to illustrate that is this. So, and Kathy mentioned she started treating MS before there were disease modifying therapies. In that era before disease modifying therapies, uh, the average sort of annual rate of relapses for a typical person with MS was two to three relapses per year. Now, if someone is on the most effective disease modifying therapy for them, and that's something we still need to work on, but if you're the most effective disease modifying therapies are reducing that rate of relapses to one every five or 10 years. So in my mind, that's approaching a cure for relapsing forms of MS and certainly a milestone that tells us we're getting closer. Certainly does. That, that's really encouraging information. Thanks so much. Um, Kathy, I, I'd like to ask you to join us as this is a great question for you. Sure. As parts of our country are reopening, members of our audience seem to be considering what will happen to them if they contract COVID-19. Nancy is asking, can I expect new MS symptoms if I get COVID-19? Wow. Well, thanks, Nancy. That's a, that's a good question. And a, a question that comes up not just with COVID-19, but with any infection. And as it turns out, when we get an infection of any type, our immune system has to get revved up. That's what it does. That's what it's supposed to do in order to fight the infection. In MS though, if we rev up the immune system, sometimes we rev up those immune system cells that are also the problem in MS, right? So there are certain types of immune system cells that for unclear reasons target certain cells and tissues in the central nervous system and cause inflammation and damage there. So sometimes when someone has an infection and their immune system is doing what it's supposed to do, it can also stir up some MS activity. And some people actually experience a relapse. Now, our disease-modifying therapies that Bruce just talked about really can dampen that impact, okay? And so that you would see less of that. The other thing that can happen is that sometimes when you get an infection, the immune system will produce fever. Fever is actually an important part of our immune system response. But fever is not the best friend of somebody with MS. It's kind of like Superman and kryptonite. And uh, we all know what happens to Superman. And so when someone has a fever, a hot room, a temperature from an infection, they can have a reoccurrence, a recrudescence of old symptoms visual blurring if they had optic neuritis in the past, more numbness and tingling, a new weakness. They may not be able to think as clearly as they did before the fever. The good news is that's a pseudo relapse. And often when the infection and the fever settle down, so do the MS symptoms. So two things can possibly be happening. So what's the message? The message is if you're experiencing new symptoms or a new return of old symptoms, it's time to give uh, your healthcare provider a call and discuss that to see what, how you can best sort that out and uh, decide on any treatment if, if necessary. Bruce, let me point this question in your direction. We got a question from Bailey 
and she wants to know if there are any new medications with less risks coming. What can you tell us about the drugs in the pipeline to treat MS? Sure. So there certainly are um, you know, new agents in the pipeline, some that are actually in front of the authorities now and some that are, are in late stage clinical trials. Uh, and, um, you know, we, there's a potential for them to be uh, more effective and uh, for some people with MS. Um, and I think this safety is a little, um, you know, uh, to be determined. Uh, unfortunately, in most cases, the more effective therapies we get, um, you know, the more or the higher the risk is for adverse uh, events. And that's just a little bit of the game that um, we're playing. But uh, th with that being said, I do think, you know, we're talking about pharmaceutical therapies. And I do think um, the sort of ideas of non-pharmaceutical interventions that are low risk, but potentially um, coming with high benefits are also emerging. So we're certainly learning that um, particularly um, for progressive forms of MS, that exercise, rehabilitation, even um, diets can change the trajectory of progression um, pretty dramatically. Um, and so I think uh, when we're looking for therapies that I'd say are adjunct to the pharmaceutical therapies, um, uh, you know, there's a lot of promise for um, wellness and lifestyle and diet to um, slow down, change the trajectory with, you know, much less risk than some of the other approaches. I don't know if Kathy, if you had anything that you wanted to add. Yeah, I mean, I think I always tend to think of treatments kind of on this, on a curve, right? And so we had treatments that were moderate efficacy, but very low risk and to start with. And then we crept up to higher efficacy drugs, but maybe a little higher risk. And I think that, you know, as we come over the, the hump, then we have uh, high efficacy drugs with lower risk. And I think we, we have that now, right? So we, uh, I think even some of the tr treatments now that are considered high efficacy are actually pretty safe. And I think the next horizon um, uh, is, is really looking at MS in a completely different way. Um, we're really good at treating inflammation. Uh, I, I have, I mean, look, even our drugs are, are being tested for COVID for heaven's sake. Um, but I think that when it comes to regenerating and when it comes to um, halting progression, um, those are still areas of intense research where we need something more and something better. Um, and hopefully it will be low risk, high return. Right, and, and you also made me think a little bit, Kathy, you know, this concept of personalized medicine. So, you know, understanding what therapies, you know, and being able to determine which therapy will work for which person at, and, you know, what risks or, or safety issues that an individual person might experience with a medication will also get us to a place where we could identify an existing agent that where that sort of risk benefit profile is optimized for an, a particular person. And that'll be a combination of genetics and biomarkers and imaging and clinical history that could all paint a picture where we could hopefully, we're not there yet, but the idea would be someday to be able to, you know, determine a little bit e more easily and less trial and error, which drug or which approach works best for which person that balances the efficacy and the risk in the optimal way. Absolutely. Kathy, uh, Amanda on Facebook has asked a question that I think an awful lot of people are going to be very interested in. Amanda says, now that wearing a mask is the new normal, do you have any suggestions on how to prevent my glasses from fogging up? <laughs> it's annoying. Well, as a matter of fact, let me just go ahead and put my mask on and I'll tell you, <laughs> right up here on the bridge, I have a little piece of wire, soft, uh, like uh, actually it's a it's a large uh, paper clip that I opened up. And when I squeeze that down on my nose and breathe, I don't get any fogging of my glasses, which is fabulous. Uh, years ago, I worked in the operating room and uh, those masks have a little bit of wire right mm -hmm. up there. And when you push that down, and I wore glasses back then too, and you can stop that, uh, that fogging, which is so annoying. Um, I suppose you could use anti-fogging on your glasses, you know, that you use with um, snorkeling or skiing. 
um, you could certainly, you know, purchase that very inexpensive and that would probably help as well. That's what I, I have this, uh, uh, I'm a snowboarder and the, the, uh, I have it on hand. It would be easy to buy on Amazon, I'm sure. Right. Um, but it's, it's called Cat Crap. <laughs> That's the name of the product. Uh, nice. Works really well, uh, and I don't get any endorsement money from them. Um, but that's what I've been using is because I, I, uh, it helps with snowboarding and skiing, and it Absolutely. definitely. Absolutely. So for my snorkel gear, mine is just called Anti Fogger. You know, <laughs> no. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> well, well, thank you both for fielding all the hard questions. Uh, <laughs> You know, I think that one of the best things that anyone can do for themselves, especially during these uncertain times, is to make sure that the information they're getting is credible and reliable. So we'd like to share some resources with you, and these are resources that you can count on to be credible and be current. So let me first circle back to something I said earlier. If we were unable to get to your question today, please know that the National MS Society's MS Navigator team is available to answer your specific questions and connect you to the very best resources. I'll share all the ways that you can contact an MS Navigator in just a moment. You can always check the Society's website at nationalmssociety.org slash COVID-19 for complete updated information on COVID-19 and MS. And you can visit the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention website at cdc.gov for the latest information about COVID-19 from the federal government. This is our ninth Ask an MS Expert webinar. And if you'd like to review any or all of the past webinars, as well as this one, you'll find the video replays at the MS Society's website at nationalmssociety.org slash MS Expert. And you'll want to spell MS Expert as all one word. I'll also remind you that every week on the Real Talk MS podcast, I continue the conversation that we start here. So I hope you can take a few minutes and give Real Talk MS a listen. You'll find Real Talk MS at realtalkms.com, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Pandora, or wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Now, we're all witnessing that even during a pandemic, MS doesn't stop and neither does the National MS Society. This webinar is just one example of how the MS Society has created virtual programming on the fly, so no one has to face MS alone. They've also created virtual support groups, they've provided resources and information about COVID-19 so that people affected by MS can get answers to their questions and healthcare providers can deliver the very best care to their patients. The society continues to amplify the voices of the MS movement to influence important public policy decisions. And as we've heard today, they've never stopped advancing the research that will find a cure. The National MS Society COVID-19 Response Fund has been established to ensure that the society can meet the urgent and expanding needs of the MS community during these unprecedented times. And I'm asking you as you're able, to support the National MS Society's work by making a donation to the COVID-19 Response Fund. To donate, you can just text the word GIVE to 68686, and you'll get a link right back that'll take you to the Society's COVID-19 Response Fund webpage. Or you can point your browser at the URL that's on your screen. That's ntlms.org slash responsefundcovid and make your donation that way. So however you choose to contribute, please contribute today. It's never been more important. I promise that we'd share all the ways for you to connect to an MS Navigator with your questions. And you'll be able to find them on the Society's website at nationalmssociety.org, or you can contact an MS Navigator by phone at area code 800-344-4867 or you can email your questions to an MS Navigator at contactusnmss at nmss.org. You can also connect with the National MS Society on your favorite social media channels, including Facebook, 
Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, and LinkedIn. And when you do, please make sure to like those social posts and subscribe to those channels. And you'll want to make sure that you get on the Society's mailing list by signing up at their website. That way, you'll receive regular updates on upcoming programs and the latest information on MS treatments, research, and how to live the very best life with MS. I'd like to thank Kathy Costello and Dr. Bruce Bebo for sharing their knowledge and insights with us today. And I'd like to thank everyone for your great questions. Please remember that a recording of this webinar is going to be available for your review on the Society's website at nationalmssociety.org slash msexpert. And now I have a quick favor to ask each of you. Getting your feedback on today's webinar is important. So you'll see a survey pop up in a moment when we close out the webinar. And by the way, if you're watching on Facebook Live, you'll see a link to that survey pinned to the comments section. And on YouTube, you'll find that link in the program description. Completing the survey makes a real difference. The information you provide helps us continually improve and it helps shape future webinars. The survey only takes one minute and it makes a difference. So please take that minute and fill it out. On behalf of Kathy Costello, Dr. Bruce Bebo, and the National MS Society, I want to thank you once again for joining us. Please stay safe and make healthy choices.